What's up guys, in this interview that I have with Gerard, a sourcing expert that spent most of his time in China where they have a factory and uh, sourcing services that they offer, uh, we're going to cover many sourcing from China topics like manufacturing, uh, inspections, payment terms and much more. So make sure that you watch the entire video so you can get the most value out of it. Now before we're moving into the video, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click the bell so for every new video that I release, you can get notified and keep yourself up to date with the latest news related to Amazon FBA and leave a comment I subscribe down below so I can personally reply to your comment. And one last thing, make sure that you go to sourcingmonster.com and you subscribe to the newsletter because I share their tips and updates that I don't share or upload here on YouTube. Uh, let's start with the video now. Hello guys, we have Gerard here. He is a sourcing expert that spent most of his time in China. He just uh, launched his factory there and he's an expert in sourcing from China. Um, Gerard, I really appreciate you uh, being here on this uh, interview. And why won't you tell about yourself, who you are? Hey, Tomer. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. I do appreciate it. So yeah, uh, my name is Jared Haw. Uh, we we started our factory about five years ago, and uh, the goal of starting this was to help entrepreneurs, startups, and uh, small businesses to be able to go to China with a valuable supplier and to be able to make the products there. Uh, so we decided to start the our own factory just because we saw a lot of trading companies and. We wanted to provide as much value as we can. So we decided to set up our first just assembly line because we sh weren't really sure where we wanted to go, whether it's going to be with um, apparel, hard goods, soft goods. Um, so we just started an assembly line and we kind of let our clients to dictate where we would go. And if we got some good clients, then we would just be investing into production lines with them. So now we're 15 CNC machines, eight lathe machines, oh, sorry, three lathe machines and eight stamping machines. Oh. Um, so that's that's where we have are today. We we've been growing pretty quickly. We were a thirty five thousand square foot factory. Now we are a hundred fifty thousand square foot factory in Dongguan. That sounds really like complicated to me when you have like warehouses and everything in China. I used to work like with with the government there, like approvals, licenses. Is that like complicated or it's like something that you can figure out? It's something we could figure out. We are Hong Kong owned. Um, so we do, we have that for us. Um, we do have partners as well, especially with HR that are able to help us maneuver some of the guidelines and things like that. So it's, it's not overly complicated. Uh, my partner kind of, he deals more with that because it's, um, that's his side more. Got you. Nice, nice. Okay, great. Uh, so I hear how, how I hear about you is by uh, an interview that you gave to Gary about like sourcing in the U.S. Uh, but I know things changed uh, a lot this year. And from your perspective, like how how you look at sourcing in China versus like sourcing in the U.S. these days. So these days, it's definitely. I mean, China definitely has the infrastructure. Uh, they have everything that is there. Um, they're set up in the U S it's still, you know, it's, there's still a lot of problems with sourcing products from the U S. Um, it depends on the product though. So let's say if you have a plastic parts making in the U S might be okay because plastic resin is more of a, it's more of a commoditized item. So what you get it for in China is going to be similar to what you get it for in, uh, in the U S but let's say if you have more complex products, the U S really lacks the infrastructure in order to just organize the supply chain um, and everything with production quality, engineering support is lacking here. It's that that's, these are great things about sourcing in China just because they have the infrastructure, the amount of uh, manufacturing engineers they have in just one city, one small city, one small district in China is in more than the entire US side. Um, so you do have that huge support um, Supply chain there is very vast. It's huge. A lot of people are saying that they're moving out. They're maybe going to Vietnam, Malaysia, the U.S., Mexico. But once they make that transition, they they might start to regret it just because of 
you know, like the infrastructure and um, everything that is already set up in China. And that's, that's kind of why we went there as well, just because we were, you know, kind of taking advantage of the infrastructure that was there. We didn't have to lay the path or anything. Yes. We, were just, we, we just set, we just set up a factory and we were just able to use our partners because um, my partner, he was sourcing for 20 years. So he already had the supply chain in the U S it's, it's very lacking. It's, it's great for, maybe um, aerospace, uh, automotive. But once you get into consumer electronics, consumer goods, it, it's, it lacks it um, yeah. here, in the, here in the US. Yeah, I, I tried at some point when the pandemic started to source from India. And I, like for me, it was so hard. And like you said, they don't have the infrastructure that China has. They don't mm -hmm. also have the... Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the right uh, communication or way for you to handle like things at scale. And even if you pay a little more money in China, it's still worth it because at the end of the day, the production time will be faster and the quality will be better. So yeah, for me, like it like, makes sense to do it in China, like most of the people, but some categories, like you said, uh, maybe like uh, I source also, I make like hand cream, okay? And to bring it from China didn't make a big difference in pricing. I don't know why, but it didn't make a big difference. Plus, you can use that made in US and market, especially when it's something that you put in your hands. People are still scared uh, to use products from China for that, I feel. Uh, so I think that for, like you said, specific categories or certain products, um, it makes sense to do it here. Other than plastic and like hand creams, do you have any other like product that you, you know that, okay, this for sure is better just to, to do it here, cost-wise or some other limitations? Anything that's not labor intensive. Um, so let's say if it could be um, automated, then it could be made here. But to automate a process, you need volume and you do need some sort of scale to it. Um, so that's why plastics is okay. Just because you put it in the machine, that's really it. Um, mm -hmm. usually you probably should get the tool from China because tooling, making tooling in the States is quite expensive. But if you get the tool from China and you ship it to the U S to your, to your supply in the U S they could probably compete with, compete with China. But if there's going to be any sort of assembly, then the U S loses all, all of their, uh, all their competitive advantage. Uh, anything with assembly probably should be done in China just because, you know, it's just, it's not cheap. They just, China, they also have that mindset. You know, yes. they, they work tirelessly for, for their clients. That's what, not just we do, but all of our suppliers and all of our competitors, um, they all work tirelessly for their clients. In the U.S., in India, it's a little bit of a different story. It's more nine to five, while in China, it's nine to, you know, sometimes midnight or eight to midnight, whenever, you know, like, it's like, if you have a problem, they will solve it. But if you have a problem here, or if you have a problem in India, you might have to have a, maybe a Chinese engineer get on a flight, go to India, or come here to solve the problem, especially if it's a technical problem. Um, so it's, um, what I've seen, the only things that could really be made here in the US competitively will be plastics, metals you're paying a pre premium for, uh, but it also depends on the, the industry. If it's just consumer goods, then, might not be so uh, competitive here. Uh, maybe not so many certificates, but let's say if you're, it's, it's a highly regulated industry, then maybe um, having a plant here to make it for you is going to be better. Maybe that's going to be uh, pharmaceuticals, automotive, more things yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. I find it also, like you said, like they, they will answer, like I would send them a message like in their time, like two o'clock in the night, 2 a.m. And they will reply. I'm like, what, you don't sleep? So yeah, the, the, their, their service is really good. Um, as far as like dealing with, with you know, uh, suppliers, factories, do you see mm -hmm. value in having a sourcing agent or someone like works for you in China or just communicate directly with factories and manufacturers from here remotely? Uh, for me, the beginning, I saw like a uh, good uh, value with the sourcing agent, but then I tweaked my process and now I don't see a big difference uh, between me just talking directly to factories and suppliers, but I want to hear from so you. So you, you have that uh, experience of communicating with factories. You've probably been sourcing for years, so you understand how to speak with them. Um, 
And you've probably figured out that you speak differently with them than you would speak with me. Um, you kind of have to word things. You have to speak in a certain way that they will understand, it, especially if you're developing new products. So let's say if you do have this experience, I always recommend speaking directly with the factory. Of course, I am biased because, you know, of my, of my situation. Yeah. But that's also why we started it. We saw more value of having a factory set up rather than just a trading company. Because at the end of the day, a trading company, they don't have really any say in the, you know, in production and quality. It's going to be a factory and they could easily go behind the trading company's back. Um, and of course, that will happen. But it all depends on, in, in, in Chinese, they say the guangxi, the relationship that you have with the, um, with the clients, with the factory. Um, if you have a great relationship with a supplier, they're going to do anything for you. I mean, such as even, you know, messaging you at two o'clock in the morning. Um, with a trading agent, they, they might not have this yes. um, because it, it's a little bit more personal if, if, you're, if you're dealing with the if you're dealing with the factory directly. Of course, there are, you know, cases on both sides where maybe the supplier totally screwed you over. Um, and then there are other cases where the supplier really saved you. Yes. Um, so it depends on, it really does depend on that relationship. Um, you know, suppliers, they're, they're people, they don't want to be taken advantage of. We always hear the one side of the story, especially in the US. Uh, but I've heard a lot of, you know, stories as well with, you know, just speaking with the suppliers, our partners as well about, how clients have also screwed them over. So it is kind of like a two-way street and um, there has to be mutual respect. And if we, if, we, if we go at it together, there's no reason why um, a client cannot be communicating directly with a supplier. But let's say if you're starting out for the first time, you want to source your first product, maybe, a, um, maybe an agent would be the best route to go through because they could help you set up some sort of infrastructure um, there's no reason to really have an office there, um, but maybe someone that you just contract out to maybe find a product. There's dozens of those companies that you, you just search on Google and they, they could help you set up. But then once you, once you start to scale, it's important that you do own your own supply chain, meaning that you have, or you yourself, or you hire someone to communicate with the, the with your suppliers directly, just because then, you know, let's say if, if I have to talk to, the supplier, or sorry, to the agent, the agent has to talk to the supplier. It's kind of like playing the telephone game. You know, something might get dropped. Um, and it's also going to take a lot longer. So what should take maybe an hour to figure out might take a day. Um, and then things will be dropped. Um, yeah. But then again, if you're doing it for your first time, the agent's going to understand what to say. They're going to be able to walk you through the process while the supplier might be like, well, you have to do your due diligence. We don't want to talk with you because you obviously have no idea what you're talking about. The agent's going to be more likely to be okay with holding your hand. So it kind of all depends on where you are. I think that also some sourcing agents, for example, I want to source a new product that for me, I don't really know a lot about like electronics. That, mm -hmm. And you have like sourcing agents or companies like yours that specify in specific category that they have all these knowledge that could really help you and save you a uh, ton of time. So I think then it may, may, may make sense, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you find like, so let's say if you want to do apparel, don't find a sourcing agent or a factory that um, specializes in consumer electronics, find yeah. someone that, you know, specializes in apparel that could really help you out. And then you could really leverage them for product developments, logistics, uh, anything going forward. I agree. Uh, since you mentioned this, um, I, you know, what, what are the steps to really developing a business relationship in China, you know, that will help you like get a better pricing and better production times and having the suppliers, uh, you know, with you and having this great relationship, any tips or, uh, hacks like to create these relationships? Transparency is always key. Um, so the worst thing for us is when a client will say that their MOQ will be, 10,000 units of a product that's maybe 10, 20, 30 dollars or whatever. And then once they go place their first order, it's going to be a thousand. Because then you, you, right when that happens, you really lose a lot of that trust. You really lose a lot of things with that, especially if you have developed the product for a long time with the clients. Um, so that's why I always say transparency. A, a, supplier's, a supplier would rather you say 1,000 than 10,000 units for the first order just because you're being honest. Um, 
let's say if you want to spend, you know, 10,000 and then the supplier also knows that you have no cash flow for maybe marketing sales. And it's great that you could have, a, uh, you know, have such a high order, but you're not going to have any reorders just because you ate up your cash with, you know, with inventory when you should have been pressing sales and marketing. Um, so, you know, factories, they have made investments, you know, into their production line. So they understand the process, you know, and the return. So they don't want you to be eating up all of their, all of their cash, all their inventory with just one thing because you have to spread it to the, to the, um, to the rest of the organization. Uh, so that's why transparency is very, very key. Trust is very important. Um, asking for advice, don't tell them what to do. I mean, it's their machines, it's their um, it's their you know assembly line. So of course they know how the type of materials, they know how to be processing it, they know how to fabricate it. So once you tell them how it should be made, as well as kind of you know you don't tell someone how to do their job. Yeah. Um, you know of course Apple and you know some of these other companies they're exceptions, but one person can't do everything all by themselves. So that's why you have to leverage a a contract manufacturer, a supplier, just because they understand the materials. Um, so always ask permissions uh, or ask, you know, ask their questions about, you know, what kind of materials and then uh, speak with them as well about lead times. You know, they're, they're people, you know, so it's, um, they're not robots. So just, you know, um, treating them with respect um, and try to just leverage them, try to get as much out of them as possible. They don't, they don't really care because, you know, if, uh, if a, if a client never asks me a question, I, I think it's kind of strange. But when a client will ask me a bunch of questions and I say, okay, they're in this for the long run, they want to sell a lot of this and they know that they could leverage our resources to be able to make their product better so they could sell more and more and more, make it more expensive, have more iterations or uh, things like this. Yeah, do you see value of like, you know, for Amazon sellers to have trip to China to build this relationship? I know that, I, that my plan was to travel this year. And one of the main reasons is to build this relationship to know them, to go and visit their factories, see how our products are being made. Uh, what, what do you think about like having trips? Like oh yeah, and suppliers, they love it when when they when they have clients come, just because, you know, then it's, it's marketing for them. They can take pictures, put on their Alibaba wall or whatever. So yeah, that's, that's always the best thing, but you have to also understand when do you want to go? So let's say if you're, if your first order is five thousand dollars, it doesn't make much sense because it's a thousand to get there, a thousand to come back, and then you know all the expenses. So why even go? And but let's say you know if you're starting to ramp up, um, you're scaling up, you're doing pretty well, such as yourself. It would be a good, you know, it would be good for you to go meet them, um, you know, and then they could also take you to some of the other suppliers. You can learn about them, and um, you know, and that's that is th that is helpful, and it does help to build, you know. The relationship but if you cannot then even a video call right now will be okay video. um mm -hmm. that would be okay mm -hmm. i know that many of my suppliers they use like translating they don't really speak uh, good english enough so they don't okay. really feel comfortable like having even like a call so i'm not sure how it's going to work like i'm, I'm gonna be like a translator or someone but yeah uh, one of another reason for me to go to China is to get better payment terms. Um, obviously, it's big part when you scale, when you get get bigger, uh, to get payment terms and things like that. Any like tips on how to really ask or when to ask for payment terms? Now it works. So yeah, the, um, let's say I guess another thing to build good, uh, you know, good relationship is don't get greedy with the payment terms. Um, especially at first, because then that might, the supplier might just not work with you. So let's say if you ask for a net 30, net 60, without any sort of relationship, they're always going to say no, and they're going to find it quite odd. But once you build that relationship, um, you could start to negotiate some of your payment terms and just really just ask. Um, there's nothing wrong with just asking that suppliers. Uh, I mean, clients, they ask us all the time. And it's really, sometimes it's a big deal. Sometimes it's not a big deal. And we'll more likely say yes, just, you know, depends on how you explain it. If you explain it in a way that, you know, it's, you feel like you should for no reason, then okay, then probably not. But let's say, you know, if you, if, if you're working with other suppliers and they're, you know, they're offering you better payment terms, maybe it's the down payment of 50% and then the balance net 30 or, you know, something like this, then the other supplier will most likely say yes. 
why not? Uh, it depends on your value, depends on uh, the margins that the, uh, the supplier is making as well. If they're very thin with the margins, they might say, no, no, because it's, it's not worth it for them. But let's say if they're making decent margins, they might, you know, they might be okay with it. And you can figure that out just by, you know, if you have more of a commoditized item, just by uh, fishing around and, you know, ask, asking some others. Um, but I would say once you start to build relationship, you could start to negotiate some, some payment terms with them. Yeah. Um, I also hear it from someone that, you know, like you said, it depends how you ask. So one good approach is like asking them or explaining them that if they give you payment terms, you will be able to just place bigger orders. You give them more business. So it's like a win-win. Um, but, you know, right. I, I didn't really, I like, I only have one or two suppliers that agree, not really payment terms. They just allow me to place an order for like uh, 10,000 units and I will ship on demand. So everything is ready. And then whenever I need stock, I will just pay for whatever I'm actually uh, shipping or taking. Uh, so it's good on, you know, it saved me all the production time because the stock is ready. Um, another question for you. Um, I know that you spoke about it, but, um, you know, trading company versus working directly with a factory. It's like, you know, it's not the sourcing agent, but it's sometimes they get you better deals, these trading companies, uh, than what you can find by yourself. Uh, I didn't have a good experience with that. Uh, because like you said, like you, you just, uh, it's another person, another middleman here and communication is longer. And if you need to fix something, it's like, it's not that easy. Uh, but maybe you have advantages that you see in working with trading companies? Yeah, I mean, there's there's always advantages. The I wouldn't see it as a cost advantage. I would see it as more of a project management logistics uh, advantage. So they could help you to ship out. They could probably do DDP shipping, which means that they ship it directly from the supplier to your doorstep. Or if the supplier wants to do FOB, they could help you with that process for a new for a new seller on Amazon or a new entrepreneur or whoever, even a lot of the clients that we work with, um, they place a pretty good size order, but once it comes to logistics, they have no idea what they're talking about. So that we're able to help them out and provide them with you know DDP pricing to ship directly to their door, FOB, which is to the ports, or just X work, which is just when we make it, keep it in our uh, warehouse and then they come, I mean, they, they have their freight forwarder come and pick it up. So we could work with them through this. And that's kind of why we are valued as well, because we, we, we kind of work as a trading company a bit as well, just because our mindset is, it's not like a traditional Chinese company. So I guess, you know, there, there are a lot of advantages of working with a, uh, a trading company, but it, it also depends on your size. Once you, once you do scale up, once you're starting to make some money, it might be more beneficial just to have someone on your team that focuses on the supply chain operation side, um, that understands the Chinese customs, that understands logistics, maybe product development. If you want to develop your own product and have your own niche and focus on brand identity, um, that then it's you might want to have your own um, have your own guy um, yeah. communicate with that. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, like quality, how, how do you like guarantee the quality from China for, for goods? I know doing like inspections, it's, it's one way of, you know, like at the end, but obviously you don't want to do inspection, then figure out everything is wrong. Uh, how do you guys approach this? Like? So we have three different uh, departments within quality. We have IQC, which is incoming. We have PQC, which is in process, and FQC, which is final quality control. So the first one is uh, incoming quality control, IQC. That's just raw materials coming into our facility. Um, that's it. Or let's say if we we buy a bike wheel for a product or something like that, then you know we buy that wheel, and that still comes in through the IQC department, and they they check the the products or the parts that are coming in from other suppliers. So for raw material, it might be the color to make sure that it's the right grade, make sure there's no scratches and things like this. And then PQC is going to be in process, which is it's going to be fabricated. So let's say if you're making a part that is going to be CNC'd, um, 
So you have the the block that was checked at IQC, then that block goes to uh, the CNC machine and then it's processed. After it's processed, it puts the holes in it or you, receive, you remove the, mater um, the materials, excuse me. Then you look at it again, you measure it, you make sure that it's uh, aesthetically appealing. It's uh, maybe if it's if it has some sort of functional part to it, um, you check it there, that's going to be in process. And then after that, it's moved to probably the assembly line. And then you assemble it. And then after you assemble it, that's going to be FQC. And that's when you're looking for, um, you know, how does the parts function? And that is when you get into the very nitty gritty specifics of that part. So it's just not going to be color purple, it has to be a Pantone color. It's not going to, and then it also has to have some sort of functional aspect, such as it has to bear at least 50 pounds of weights. Um, and there's going to, you have to make it as objective as possible. Once you start leading a subjective quality standard, you wouldn't get into trouble. Subjective would be yellow. There are many different shades of yellow. An objective uh, standard would be the Pantone uh, for that. Um, and then your the supplier should always be really, especially you know, during this process, holding your hand because, you know, it's the supplier, they're also really, they really do care about the quality. What they don't like is when someone says yellow, they give them a yellow product and they say, no, not this yellow, a different yellow. That's what they really don't like. And that's how things could start breaking. Um, so kind of like even the communication going forward to try to make the quality standards as objective as possible. Um, anything that could break, anything that has a pain point or pinpoints, there should be some sort of standard to make sure that it does not, um, you know, that it, that it is able to, you know, carry out that task. Of course, companies like me, we, uh, we provide you with DFM, which is designed for manufacturing. So before we go into production, we look into each individual part to make sure that the, uh, the price is okay, the warranty is going to outlive the products, um, all of these things just to make sure that when we do get into production, you know, we know it's going to be good. But even when you get into production, you still have to follow the standards just because it's, it's a manufacturing process. There, there's tolerances, there's, there's things built in and there's, you know, there's things go wrong all the time. But once you have that quality standard, you know, yes, or you have, you know, no. And if it's no, you have to send it back to the previous departments, um, whether that's going to be at the fabrication line in our facility to the anodizing powder coating or to the raw material supply or whatever it is. Um, so quality control is very good for more of a commoditized item. Um, some people, they, they like to hire quality control agents. Um, if the agent, the sourcing agent is not able to do that, that's, that's definitely okay to do, especially to, you know, when you're first launching these, the last thing you want to do with, uh, with launching a product for the first time is ship out a product with quality issues. No yeah. one's going to trust you, especially if you don't deal with it well. Um, the supplier might not accept it, especially if you have a subjective um, quality standard because, you know, my eyes are different than your, your eyes. Your eyes are different than another person's eyes and, you know, Yellow is yellow for someone else, but yellowish orange is borderline. It's, you know, you get into too many, you really get into too many questions. And the point of a quality standard is, so there's no questions. So there's nothing left to, um, to interpret by yourself that, you know, it's all, it's all there. Just if someone comes into my office with a quality problem, it's the question is, you know, or the answer is always just, what does the quality standard say? It's, you know, it's, it's not my opinion. It's just what, what, this piece, what does this piece of paper say? That's all that matters. And of course we have golden samples, which are uh, mass produced items that are perfect that we have to follow as well. And if it's able to follow all of those and we ship out and we really never do have a problem just because our, our quality control is quite objective and it's, you know, it's, um, it's been agreed upon by both parties well in advance um, of production. Yeah, I had, I had like a bad experience with that. Uh, it was like a wood product and I didn't really set like the standards or expectations between me and the supplier and what I thought that it should be like it was kind of rough and and I thought like I'm gonna get like a good finish like smooth polished finish and I didn't get it so I told him like and they got upset but no one really like we never talked about it they they they, they told me yeah and they were like, like you said, it was kind of like a little fighter, but you know, obviously we, we got over this, but I learned 
a valuable lesson that you should set expectations before you start. We want X, Y, Z, everything should be written. And then, you know, you, you show them this. There is no opinion, like you said, it's just facts and requirements. And try to get a sample of that part too. So for that wooden part, try to get a sample, like what we call it is a golden sample, like the perfect sample that you should expect to receive every single time for production. Um, so then you'll see if it should be matte, glossy, shiny, you know, things like this. It'll all be right there for you. Yeah, it's, it's a good point actually to have like a, like you said, like a golden uh, sample. And then if it's not like that, you can just show them the difference, like uh, one. Oh, it's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then if if there's proof, I mean, you have to you have to back up your arguments with data, with with supporting facts. And if you do that, the the supplier is not going to say no. Um, you know, you just have to convince them. They will say no, of course, if there's no supporting arguments. Hopefully, you know, if you're working with someone with at least a little bit of morals and ethics, um, then they should replace it because you know we all do business the same way. We want returning customers. We don't want to always be finding new customers because in every single business that's way too expensive. We have to retain our current customers and make our current customers happy. And then we could, you know, that's that's the best way to grow. And they do want to they do want to keep their customers happy, but if they like. Um, if you say like, this is not yellow, just I guess that example again, um, they're gonna say, no, this is yellow. It's, you know, it, it is, you said yellow, this is yellow. And they're true, you're also right, but it's, you know, that that's when you get into that, that friction. Because they feel they don't need to do like the entire job again for something they did right, yeah. So, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, how, what is the best way to pay, you know, to Chinese suppliers? I know like for big orders, you have to pay wire transfer, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, scary, especially if you don't have a little like relationship with them, like how you recommend to someone outside China, uh, you know, to, to pay suppliers, Alibaba, um, like PayPal. So PayPal would be nice. Uh, with us, clients will do PayPal, but only for samples. Um, all of our mass production is wire transfer. But then again, we also do have a an office in America, so they could pay the the um, the office in America. It's much easier for them. And then you know, if let's say if something does go wrong, it's an easy target. Um, it's not like a Chinese supplier where it's very difficult to track them down. Um, so, but yeah, it's um, I guess that's also going to be with the payment terms. What are your payment terms? If you're not comfortable with paying 100 percent upfront, maybe they could do. 50% down payments. Um, I would always ask for a 50% down payment first, especially, you know, for the first order. Um, it's not very reasonable for, um, you know, to have 100% down payment unless your order is very small and banking fees will be, you know, take up some of your margins and that's the only thing. Um, so I would, I think they are uh, with, mo I mean, all of our suppliers, we pay them out of our Chinese office, but it's, um, um, usually, usually wire transfer for us as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to pay with credit cards. So I have like another layer of protection. But for big orders, it's kind of like it's annoying because you have to break it down to a couple of orders. They have some limitations and the fees and all of that. But right. yeah, you know, Alibaba also have trade insurance. So if you pay through Alibaba, you have kind of another layer. Of oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've we we don't do business with Alibaba suppliers. Um, I've, I've actually never sourced products through Alibaba, but that's, that is nice that they do have that just in, in case if there is a dispute, it could be handled internally with Alibaba and I'm sure they support their, um, their clients, which are, you know, yeah. people like you and Amazon sellers and trade shows. people. <laughs> Uh, do you recommend? I know that many suppliers that are not on Alibaba they show up on trade shows, trade shows that are in China, like the Canton Fair and all of these places. That's that's. Do you have like any other ways to find suppliers that are not on Alibaba, or other uh, websites? For luckily for us, we uh, we've had that infrastructure, but and you know plus we're there. So once you're you know when you're in China, it's easier. You know, just get in a car. You can drive there. They're all within a you know, an hour radius of you. Um, but yeah, that's really Alibaba is the best one. 
I mean, there's trade shows in America, um, but those are more niche, like uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, um, you know, other things like that. If you're doing electronics, CES might be pretty cool to go to. There's tons of Chinese suppliers there that go there. It's, it's really, it's crazy. Um, but there are also other, other trade shows as well in which Chinese suppliers will come to the U.S., um, and you could meet them. It's, you know, it's much easier to do that than going over there and, you know, trying to get a DD or a taxi to go to their facility. Uh, you know, especially if you don't have a, a SIM card over there, it's quite difficult to get around. So it's always, it's always easier if they come here, then you can meet them and, uh, you know, show them your office or show them your production or sorry, your products and, you know, things like that. It's, um, because, yeah, it's, I'm sure there's other trade shows as well, not just CES, where the suppliers come to the U.S. and display their products. Maybe not anytime soon, but... I hope soon that, you know, we, we, it's going to be over with the vaccine and all of that, but it's going to take a good couple of months. Anyway, mm-hmm. Jared, I really appreciate all these answers. I learned a ton of things. I'm sure all the people are going to watch this video uh, gonna learn new things for sure and it will help them understand it better how how it works like sourcing from China and the US and in general like it works and yeah I would like to thank you again I hope we can talk more in the future I wish you a great 2021 and new year and if people want to uh, learn more about your services about what you offer uh, where, where they can find you Yeah, please uh, visit us at epowercorp.com. So that's E-P-O-W-E-R-C-O-R-P.com. Or you could reach out to me at jared at epowercorp.com as well. That's J-A-R-E-D. Yeah, guys, check their their website. Um, I I think they're professionals. And uh, like I told you before this call, I might contact you and work with you with uh, some products in the future. So thank you again. Happy New Year. And uh, have a good one. Oh, thanks. You too. I appreciate you having me on. Of course. Take care. All right. Take care.